Good afternoon, Priya Pratada. Uh, Hello. Hello. Hi, Shubham. Hi, hi. 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 Third batsman arrived. Mm. Good afternoon, Ranjul. This arrow is a no IC, sir. Is a good thing. Good afternoon, all. Ah, all good, afternoon. good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hey, Tokuni to find a bullshit. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm really glad to see you. Really glad. Yeah, it was very interesting workshop. Actually, I just now came from Chennai.
Doctor Moon, Doctor Mister. How are you? I hope fine. <laughs> yes, sir. Fine. <laughs> yes, sir. Very glad to see you. No. <laughs> we are really, uh, really feel happy that he, both of you and Nagendra sir are present here today. Okay, okay. Nagendra sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good afternoon, Professor Nagendra. Ah, <laughs> oh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you, sir? Uh, very, very glad to meet you. <laughs> Uh, how are you, sir? Uh, okay. Uh, you are in uh, Karnataka or uh, in Chennai? <laughs> oh, yeah, just now I came. Okay, okay. okay. Just one five minutes back I came from Chennai. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, what is the time for? 4 p.m. for us? Sir? 4 p.m. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are just going to start. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. So, um, I'm asking to uh, my HOD, sir. Sir, uh, should we start? It's 4 sharp. Shikar Shah. Sir? Sir? Madam? No, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm asking actually my HOD. Ashish, okay, Ashish okay, sir. Actually, okay. sir. Okay. I'm only on my team. Okay, so our HOD uh, uh, just left due to some internet issues. Uh, he is just joining. After that, we will start.
Okay, uh, I think uh, Dr. Maji has joined. So we can start now. Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from Bengal. Department of Geology, Kobi Jagudram Rai, Government General Degree College, Bankura of West Bengal, India, welcome you all. Today we have been assembled here on this virtual platform to be a part of the one day international online workshop on fundamentals of planetary science methods and scopes myself nivedita chakraborty accompanied by my departmental colleague ms indrani mondol being the organizing secretaries of this workshop like to now invite our respected head of the department and uh, the IQSC coordinator of our college, Dr. Ashish Kumar Maji, for the welcome address. Sir, please. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. A, a very good afternoon to everybody. I feel privileged to extend warm welcome to all of you to the one day international workshop on fundamental plan of planetary science methods and scopes during the fag end of the pandemic period we have been virtually clubbed together uh, to attend this workshop instead of gathering under the same roof in our college with time the planetary science has become increasingly important, especially to combat the daunting challenges in finding out the natural processes in the extraterrestrial domain. Thus, we should be acquainted with the recent development in different fields of planetary science. The present workshop focuses modern trends on some of the important topics of planetary science this will be elaborately discussed by our three eminent resource persons from different premier institutions all around the globe. I am sure that this workshop will significantly increase in this the uh, knowledge about the planetary science to students, researchers, faculty members and all nature lovers. Enjoy the workshop with fruitful discussion. With these few words, I remain here today. Thank you. The rest of the program will be conducted by Dr. Nivedita Chakraborty and Professor Indrani Mondal, Assistant Professor of Geology, this college. Dr. Chakraborty, please. Thank you very much, sir, for the warm welcome, your thoughtful words and significant remarks. Now, I would like to invite our Honorable Officer in Charge, Professor Alok Kumar Dash, for the inaugural address of this event. Sir, please. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Fine. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to inaugurate the One Day International online workshop on fundamentals of planetary science methods and scopes organized by the department of geology of the Jagadam Rai government general degree college Mejia, Bankura, West Bengal. On behalf of the college, once again I welcome you all. In the past, scientists had only one planet to study in detail that is our art, the only place where life demonstrably exists and thrives. Nowadays, planetary scientists can apply their knowledge to the whole solar system and to hundreds of worlds around other stars. Cons 
Consequently, in recent years, planetary science has seen a tremendous growth in new knowledges such as discoveries on the surface of Mars, suggesting to an early warm way to climate and perhaps conditions under which life would have emerged and so on. This present online workshop has been framed to provide a state-of-the-art knowledge on various research methods and future research scopes of the planetary science by the eminent resource persons. I feel that it would have been better if we could arrange such sort of discussion by inviting the eminent resource persons and audiences in the college. Anyway, this online workshop will provide an excellent opportunity for the participants to explore and share the knowledge on latest advancements in planetary science. I wish a grand success of the workshop. Thank you. Thank you once again. Now over to Dr. Nivedita Chakravarti. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, for your meaningful address, encouraging words and for being with us. We will be obliged if, if you can stay with us for the rest of our program amid zero busy schedule. Thank you very much. Now we will proceed to the main segment of our event. Good afternoon to all of you once again. On behalf of Department of Geology, KJR GGDC, I would like to declare that the one-day international online workshop on fundamentals of planetary science, methods and scopes is now open. Respected officer in charge, Professor Alok Kumar Dash, respectable uh, our head of the department, Dr. Ashish Kumar Maji, honorable resource persons of this workshop, Dr. Priyabrata Dash, research investigator of astrobiology, team lead of planetary sciences, of Supernova Private Limited and visiting researcher of PRL ISRO, Dr. Ranjan Sharkar, planetary scientist and postdoctoral fellow in Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research, Gottingen, Germany, and Mr. Shubham Sharkar, DST Inspire Fellow at Space Application Center, ISRO Ahmedabad. Our distinguished guests and participations from different academic institutions, government as well as private organizations all over the country, my senior and junior colleagues, dear friends, the non-teaching members of my college, my students and all the other persons who have taken interest in this program, Especially uh, Professor B. Mishra, Professor Nagendra, uh, Professor Mahapatra. My sincere greetings and warm regards to all of you. It is my immense pleasure to welcome you all in this event. Imagining life on other planets and their moons is a fascinating area of research. Even in the recent past, science fiction writers and Hollywood directors indulged in fantasies of little green men and triplets. Now, day by day, astrobiology and planetary science are growing as serious field of research work. The planets discovered till date are mostly uninhabitable for humans, that they are either too close or to their star or enormous gas giants, if I am not wrong. Uh, our resource person will speak on this uh, even better for to me, of course. Science is now developing to the direction where we may be able to detect which planets have liquid water. Planetary science missions and research inform us about our neighborhood and our own origin and evolution. And they are necessary precursors to the expansion of humanity beyond the Earth. In the future, humans may be will return to the moon, Mars, or other solar system bodies to explore them after they have been investigated and understood using robotic missions. However, at present, the expansive nature of modern science research demands a more comprehensive approach involving ground-based plus space-based programs and observational facilities. 
importance of evolving stronger student training programs and human research generation and encouraging students or scholars to take up the space science research as a career should be facilitated keeping in this view department of geology kgr gtc has taken up this initiative of arranging a brief workshop on the fundamentals of planetary science which we hope will be useful to especially the students and early uh, researchers for learning the basics of this growing and promising field of research the workshop will also enable the participants to interact with the experts in this field it is our privilege to have three distinguished planetary scientists as our resource persons during this one day workshop all of them are very special and specialized in their own fields now i would like to request indrani my companion companion to introduce our resource persons to the audience indrani over to you thank you nivedita ji uh, for giving me the opportunity to introduce our resource person today we are thankful to have with us three promising researchers in the field of martian geology as well as the planetary science dr priyabrata das dr ranjan sarkar and mr shubham sarkar we are fortunate enough to get this opportunity to hear about such a highly demandable topic of this century it's my pleasure to introduce dr priyabrata das one of the most prominent art and planetary geoscientist currently serving as a research investigator astrobiology and team lead planetary science of space nova private limited and visiting researcher of prl and the bad isro after completion of graduation in geology honors from tdb college ranigarh dr das did his post graduation in applied geology from presidency university kolkata and received a doctoral degree in art science precambrian geology from hiroshima university japan thereafter he continued his research work at various indian institute like jadavpur university kolkata physical research laboratory isro ahmedabad and monipal academy of higher education monipal besides academics he also worked in mining and mineral industry and has consulting experience in civil engineering and geotechnical sectors he has a handsome publication list in various peer reviewed journals including precambrian research meteorites and planetary science and many more his research work has involved understanding the early geologic evolution surface processes habitability of the earth and mars using the geological geochemical and planetary mission instrument techniques he has expertization on the early geologic evolution climate and habitability of the planet mars he will also focus on the career potential of planetary geoscience and the upcoming applications of space science and technology in the society research and education sector science communications and many more today he will talk on a topic entitled as why do we explore the planets the geological perspective and the next resource person is an another distinguished planetary scientist dr ranjan sarkar currently working as a post doctoral fellow at max planck institute for solar system research gottingen germany dr sarkar did his bsc honors from ttb college ranigarh completed his masters degree in geology and phd in martian geology both from iit mumbai thereafter he also worked as a research faculty of center for astrobiology amity university mumbai his research work has involved understanding the early geologic evolutions of mars and solar system objectives using the planetary remote sensing technique His present research however mostly focused on the understanding the geological evolution and mineral mapping of asteroid series using the Mars and NASA's Dawn mission data. He has presented his research work at various international and conferences, published research articles in various national and international journals. He will deliver a lecture on geology of planetary bodies an overview of orbital explorations our third resource person is mr shubham sarkar one of the most promising future planetary scientist in the field of martian geology 
Currently, he is the DST Inspire Fellow at Space Application Center, ISRO, Ahmedabad, pursuing PhD in planetary geology from Kutch University. He is in an advanced stage of his PhD degree, will submit his thesis soon. He has expertise in planetary geology, planetary mineralogy, geochemistry, reflectance spectroscopy, Mars geology, and Mars analog. He did his BSc and MSc both from uh, Presidency University, Kolkata. Thereafter, he joined SAC, ISTRO, Ahmedabad as DST inspired research fellow. He has more than 12 research publications in multiple journals and conferences like Minerals, Geochemistry, Planetary and Space Science, LPSC, etc. The lecture entitled as Exploring Mars with uh, Perseverance Rover will be delivered by Mr. Shubham Sharkar. This is a very short introduction compared to their achievement. We cordially invite all the three research persons to our one-day international workshop and hope we will surely be enriched after this session. Now we'd like to hand over my colleague, Dr. Nivedita Chakravarti, to continue this session. Nivedita Ji, please. Unmute, and please unmute Nivedita Ji. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Indrani, for uh, such a nice introduction of our resource person. We are really pleased to welcome uh, them in our workshop and thank you very much uh, to them for their support. The lectures uh, delivered by them will cover some unique perspectives and uh, recent updates on planetary science. I believe the vividness of their lessons will not only encourage the students and scholars but also to the non-geology persons and common people. We are overwhelmed with spontaneous response of students, both UG and PG level, research scholars, teachers, professionals from different state and central universities, different government organizations and private companies. We are delighted to share with you that we have total around 150 registered participants from different institutes all over our country, including all the uh, geology department of all the government and non-government college and universities of our state, beside, uh, and uh, University of Delhi, Hansraj College of Delhi, BHU, ISRO, IIRS, uh, Deradun, Kane's Energy, GSI, and many more institutions from uh, Kerala, uh, Pondicherry, and uh, Dhanbad, Gujarat, etc. And few were from some universities of Nigeria as well. So thank you so much to all of you for showing interest uh, in this event. I hope you will enjoy to learn and this workshop will be a memorable educational event for all of us. I cordially welcome you all once again to this workshop and hope that you will all have a great time ahead. We truly value your participation and support. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your kind attention and participation. Thank you all. Now I would uh, like to move uh, in the main segment of our event, that is the technical session. In this session, we will have three lectures by three resource persons, as Indrani already mentioned. And uh, there will be two interactive sessions, one after uh, the second lecture and the third one will be the after the third lecture. Our first speaker will be Dr. Priyabrata Dash. His lecture will focus on the fundamental areas of planetary science and he will direct and coordinate the workshop after his uh, lecture as well. So I would like to invite Dr. Dash. Uh, now the virtual dais is yours. Dr. Dash. Hello. Uh, thanks, Nivita, uh, for such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> no, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. <laughs> No, really, it's, uh, I'm sure you won't mind the answer. Of course, we are actually eager. You have to We all belong to Bengal and graduation and post graduation here. And it's really nice for us to be in the group. I always appreciate this, I think. So, without wasting any time, I'll just start my talk because it's already 424. So, thank
sir uh, today uh, this topic is uh, how we uh, <coughs> you know to explore planets uh, from a geological perspective that is it because uh, planetary science is a piece of very huge and vast uh, of research and uh, people from all over the world from different backgrounds and participate uh, uh, to understand the planetary system and planetary bodies uh, but <coughs> But uh, what we, uh, we geologists, can contribute on this uh, understanding. Sir, it is not audio. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Sir, it is not audio. ियर सिस्टम बॉड In one thing, the scientists can say <coughs> the study of uh, planetary systems, and uh, uh, and it is a very really interactive uh, interdisciplinary field of research, and and from different backgrounds, from atmospheric science, from astronomy, geology, space physics, from biology and chemistry, and all of course uh, other disciplines can also participate uh, to understand these uh, planetary systems. Okay, so uh, but actually. <coughs> We can do this type of science. It's very uh, interesting too. Actually, we, everyone can do uh, this science because the data is available for this.
ده هو حكيت اوكي زاد ده تيك تيك يا مينا ده سامتين يا مينا ده جيم سامتين يا مينا ده جيم 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 يا مينا ก็ยังมีนะครับสามทีมยังมีนะครับสามทีมยังมีนะครับสามทีมยังมีนะครับสามทีมยังมีนะครับสามทีมยังมีนะครับสามทีมยังมีนะครับสามทีมยังมีน
Okay, now it's clear. Now, now I think it's stable. Oh, okay, that's right. Uh, that's right. I made the video one. So the video was from Mars. That's why we did that. So, uh, Anyone, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, the 70s, nineteen seventies image of Mars, and uh, now you can see this is the pseudo understanding of water, the covariance of water on the past, Martian past, the past, the past. Okay. And also in 2020, we got the confirmed evidence of uh, this uh, organic complex organic molecule. So, uh, so what next? What next? We get any signature of this type of structure, as well, uh, like stomatolite or something else, because mass also has the time of deposit that sodium sulfur will extend. Uh, and that's why NASA had planned this uh, you know, ongoing mission, the first year of this mission on the zero crater. Because the zero crater has a perfect place for uh, her. Actually, um, uh, this, uh, this kind of light form can be uh, visible. So, uh, for, um, I want to random sort of we will uh, discuss about the orbital remote sensing and how we can use the orbital remote sensing to understand uh, the chemistry of bodies and uh, planets. So, thank you. Hello, Ramon. Hello, yeah. Hi, can I continue? Am I audible? Oh. Yeah. Hello. Hello? Yeah, fine, you can carry on, Ramon. Okay, yeah, so I will, I will start sharing my screen. Perfect. <clears throat> Is this visible to everyone? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. So, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, I am very grateful to you for giving me this opportunity to, to say, share my excitement and curiosity that I have for planetary sciences. And I hope uh, that many of you will also uh, share the same excitement along with me. And maybe this will uh, uh, guide you to become uh, like a, a scientist in the field of, uh, in this field, or maybe even if you don't want to venture into the planetary science field, you could use these same uh, concepts and knowledge to do terrestrial uh, geosciences also as well. So uh, uh, I'll proceed with the presentation now. Here is an outline of what I will be talking about today. So I have organized this presentation as follows. First, uh, we will be looking at the orbital remote sensing. First, we will be looking at what remote sensing is and followed by some of the most common techniques and methods that we apply to analyze and interpret the satellite data. These include doing uh, some photogeologic interpretations interpretations uh, that require elevation or topographic uh, information. We'll also look at how uh, we can derive the mineralogical or compositional information from satellite data sets. And also there are lots and lots of other techniques of remote sensing which I will not be touching upon in this presentation, but I will give you, uh, like, uh, I'll state the names or the domains where those are carried out. Coming to the second part, we'll look at the available resources that uh, you can start off with, with for your own research in planetary science and so the like this includes the data source the software and the reading material that you would need to uh, like begin your career as a planetary scientist or even if you are an amateur scientist you you can always find these useful and they are mostly free things that uh, you can use so yeah so what is remote sensing? Remote sensing is the art of acquiring information about an object without actually getting in physical contact with it. Now, as an example, the first image that you see on over here, this is uh, like, uh, this is a te telescopic image of planet Mars and it has been taken through a six inch Maksutov Cassegrain telescope which is not the most powerful telescope that we have on Earth. There are much more powerful telescopes with much bigger apertures.
but this is just a hobby telescope that even you can get and you can get a pretty cool picture of mars like this from this telescope and uh, and there are details also in this image for example the southern highlands you can see as a darker shade the northern highlands as much smoother and you can also see the southern polar cap over here all this from like your backyard you can do it second you have space telescopes for example the hubble space telescope which can give you more detailed views of the the planet mars in this in this image you can see this blue blue areas these are actually uh, water frost ice clouds that are like uh, on on like uh, they are, they are swirling over the surface of mars and also at some places you can see dust storms also for example here in the northern area and and here near the hellas basin so this this sort of details you can get from like earth based telescopes and space telescopes however the earth's atmosphere is a big hindrance to telescopic observation of tel celestial bodies since it interacts with the incoming electromagnetic energy and severely alters it so and also because of the distance between celestial objects is quite large the resolution is a lot compromised so that's why you had the hubble space telescope but even then this image that you see from of, of mars taken with the hubble space telescope is from a distance of 68 million kilometers so it would have been much better if we could get closer to the surface of the planets and uh, that is the sole purpose of a satellite which is often referred to as an orbiter as it orbits the target planetary body so we can we often use these words satellite orbiters interchangeably so uh, the satellite in this picture that you see is the mars reconnaissance orbiter a very successful mission that was sent to march uh, mars uh, it was launched in 2005 and it is still active for over 16 years and it is still passing on data that that you can use to do science and people are doing remarkable science with it the image that below that you see is taken from a very small area i see it's about like 50 meters wide it's it's captured by an instrument called the high resolution imaging science experiment or high rise in short and it is capable of taking pictures of the Mar martian surface at breathtaking resolutions of 25 cm per pixel which is phenomenal and uh, in this image you can see these layers that you see uh, these are sedimentary rocks that formed millions to maybe billions of years ago from dust and uh, fine sediments that settled down from the atmosphere and were later cemented right at the first glance what you can see are cyclical variations in the sediment properties that is revealed through the sharp contrast changes and uh, there's also this blue and bluish material that is uh, occupying the low lying areas this is the, j just the dust that has been carried by the wind and deposited in uh, topographic low areas and this last la the last column that you see here you see the martian uh, rover opportunity that has acquired the, these image uh, this image of the blueberries or the hematite spherules from the meridiani planum uh, region this is taken from a very close distance you can see the scale is very very fine it's 50 meters uh, 50 millimeters sorry however it's not easy to send a rover to every point on the surface of a planet for obvious reasons so hence that's why you need orbital uh, instruments that can globe the uh, the map the entire globe albeit at a coarser resolution but you can still get a, a like broad idea of how things are on the surface of a planet and without orbiters you can never reach to the state where you can land a rover on the surface so these are very crucial for any sort of like serious scientific work that you want to do on some foreign planet yeah so now we come to photogeology and uh, the first thing that you do with remotely sensed data or any data in fact is you look at it but what exactly do you look at so the things are like here are a couple of list of things that you 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 keep in mind when you are studying uh, uh, satellite optical Im imagery first you look at the tone <clears throat> tone and texture are the two most important things out of all of them so the first thing is the tone which refers to the relative brightness and colors of objects as seen in the images it could be like you can you can use terms like bright dark uh, blue red etc second is the texture texture is the frequency of tonal variations so that means a very quick and abrupt variation in tone would give you a rough texture on the other hand a very uniform tone would give you a smooth texture uh, 
yeah and apart from these you also uh, take a note of the shape the relative size the spatial dimensions and the association of these objects with other objects in the vicinity a, a last important thing that we often find very useful in satellite data interpretation are the shadows the shadows cast by the individual objects this is important because often you do not know how tall or how deep a certain feature is so shadows can give you a very quick idea of those things you can even go on to doing quantitative measurements using shadows although it's very like difficult and tedious but you can still do it and with these in mind we can start exploring the data sets so we will start by looking at some of the like full disk images of some planetary bodies of our solar system the first image we look at is of io it's the one of the innermost uh, it's the innermost galilean satellite that orbits jupiter and io is the vol most volcanically active body in the solar system it has its surface is covered by over 400 volcanoes and out of which 150 of them 150 are always active even as we speak the image this image was acquired by the galileo spacecraft in in this image you can see two volcanic plumes one here uh, which is called uh, which is coming from the pelian patera uh, patera means a crater uh, in the planetary terminology and uh, uh, it could be a volcanic crater, it could be an impact related crater, but uh, any circular depression of the like uh, is called a patera. And here you see a promet the, the second one which is called the Prometheus plume. This is about 140 kilometers high, the, uh, the, pillar, the one from the Pelian patera and the one from the, Prome the Prometheus plume that is about 75 kilometers high. And the interesting thing is that the Prometheus plume, this one, it was visible in images that were first captured by Voyager 1 flyby in 1979. And it is present in the images that were taken by the Galileo spacecraft 18 years later. So this volcano has been active for a very long time and it might still be active even today. Apart from these, you also see a lot of coloration on the surface like these. <coughs> yellow, uh, reddish and other colors, uh, these colors are from the, they come out from the sulfur and the sulfur dioxide that are spewed out from these volcanoes. And uh, this also, all, all of this makes uh, Io the reddest object in the solar system. So if some of you are wondering, yes, it, it is so red that <coughs> you can see it <coughs> even in these images. Next, also because of this continuous volcanism, the surface of Io is recycled very fast and therefore <coughs> it has the youngest surface of all the bodies in the solar system. <coughs> Sorry. Next, uh, we take a look at uh, another of the satellites of Jupiter. This time it's Callisto. <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, in Callisto, uh, Callisto is the fourth and outermost uh, of the Galilean sat satellites. First of all, uh, what you see in this image is all bright and dark uh, <coughs> surface and <coughs> although it is the darkest of all the Galilean satellites, but it's still twice as bright as our own moon. The pronounced feature over here, this, this circular feature, it actually extends all the way up to here, is called the <coughs> Valhalla Multi-Ring uh, Impact Basin. And it is about, it extends for about 2000 uh, kilometers from this, from the center. So it's huge. The most striking features on the surface of Callisto are its craters. Crater, Callisto is famous for craters. And it is believed that these bright areas that, uh, yeah, the bright areas that you see, these are made of mostly ice and the darker areas are uh, highly eroded ice core materials. Also, Callisto is, uh, it gets the title of having the oldest surface of all the bodies in the solar system. And you, you might want to compare this with Io, which I just uh, told in the previous slide, which had the youngest surface. 
and Callisto has the oldest surface. Both of them <coughs> are satellites of Jupiter. Next is Enceladus. This is the brightest object in the solar system, Enceladus. That's because its surface is predominantly covered in ice and that makes it highly reflective. Almost it reaches 100% reflectivity uh, and hence that, that explains its brightness. Although its size is very small, it's 540 kilometers across. The most striking feature that, uh, that blew the minds of scientists were, were these active uh, erupting geysers uh, from the southern, near the southern pole. And uh, these geysers, uh, the plumes that they shot out, these jets, they were found to contain materials like uh, grains, ice grains, water vapor, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, and uh, other organic compounds. Uh, and these geyser are, geysers are long lived and they, they, they are there for a, a long time since the missions that they have uh, been ob uh, observed, all of them have found these geysers. And in fact, these, the material that has been ejected from these geysers forms a ring around the planet's uh, the Saturn. So that's called the, the, the ring E. And uh, scientists had figured this out after they found, they actually saw these geysers spewing out, uh, out uh, like uh, uh, the, the uh, plumes of water laden with all these uh, minerals. And the cause of these geysers is mostly Saturn's extreme uh, tidal forces on Enceladus, which causes heating and cooling of ice pockets or water pockets that, that lie underneath the surface. Coming next to our neighbor, we have this as uh, this is Venus. It's been taken by the Mariner 10 spacecraft, but uh, you don't really get to see the surface because everything is covered in thick clouds. The atmosphere of Venus is so dense that you don't you cannot see its surface in in the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, and not even in much of the like some of the uh, infrared also. So next we come to the surface, we actually get down to the surface. Now, we, were, we so far we were looking at the full disk images of uh, these objects, but now let's look at the surface features. Using the same elements that we discussed of, for visual interpretations, we can identify features. For example, here you see there are fluvial channels and deltas. This is from Mars. And there, there are also these, these lines which are probably uh, eroded away by winds and maybe later they'll turn into yard arms. And here, here, here's a, a picture which shows you several cross-cutting grabens. Grabens are normal faults or uh, horsed, uh, faults bounded on both uh, blocks, bounded on either side by normal faults. And they cross-cut, so several ages, they, they are formed over a long period of time. And there are craters also, so little, little craters spattered all uh, across the surface. Here in the center, we have Olympus Mons. It is the highest uh, volcanic uh, mount uh, has volcano in the entire solar system. It's about 21 kilometers high. It's so high that its top even sticks out of the atmosphere. And uh, this image is, uh, unlike these images, this image is an off another image. That is, it is taken at a like slightly slanting uh, angle. So that's why you get a perspective view and you know how high the, the like the thing is high. You you get the perspective. On the right, you see these are again Grabens, but these are from Mercury, planet Mercury. And uh, lastly, here we have, uh, uh, this is a thrust fault that has been displaced by a normal fault. So interesting. And uh, another thing that uh, you might want to like keep in mind is, don't always expect that you find the same sort of geomorphological features on these uh, other planetary bodies. Many times you will come across things that you have never seen before and that will be a challenge for you to explain uh, how these features have formed. And uh, that would be really fun if you ever come across any such features. There are a lot of features already which are unexplained and people are working on them. So you can take a look at those features. <coughs> Topography, yeah. So far we were only looking at optical images. But optical images are good for only visual identification and some sort of uh, like visual classification. So it's more like uh, qualitative and subjective. However, if you want to carry out more uh, quantitative measurements, you would need information on the elevation of the objects. There's a lot 
more you could do if you have the elevation values along with the uh, optical values we call it geo registration so if you have both of them registered uh, like the same you have the same elevation value for the pixel that you are talking about so you can do a lot of quantitative analysis with that it's like adding a new dimension to the way of the way you visualize planetary bodies so two two dimensional things become uh, three dimensional on the left this is an optical color image of mars taken from the uh, like created by images from the viking or viter and uh, this is a global shape model or elevation model or digital elevation model wh wh whatever it refers to the uh, uh, an image that contains only the elevation values so this is not taken by a camera or something this is actually taken by a laser altimeter and it it gives you the values of the uh, surface heights for example here you can see it's the, the scale is mentioned the zero is the datum and anything above it is higher in altitude and anything in the, in the bluish blue bluer shades is low in altitude so these are the volcanoes they stand up high and these are the canyons and the low low lying regions of mars which are uh, uh, below the surface datum so what you do is when you warp this optical image on the elevation image you get a 3d rendering like this and that first of all it's aesthetically very pleasing and beautiful to look, look at a thing like this but more importantly observe that the the volcano over here is spawnis mons it's completely flat you don't see the elevation if you have to infer that it is a volcano it will be only through your experience but here after the, it's 3d rendered you can see it is elevated and not just it the other features also the olympus mons and the other uh, volcanoes asreas and uh, pavonis arcia mons and uh, in the center also you have valles berenaris which is well depressed the way it is supposed to be unlike here where you have to again infer it from your own experience that it is a depression so uh, you can see that uh, having a uh, topography information makes you very like it enables you to do a lot of things so much so that after a certain amount of time if you are not having the topographic information you will always feel that you are missing out something Uh, moving on to the next slide uh, here i will describe some of the applications of the topographic data firstly if you combine it with the gravity information you can infer the internal structure of a planet here in this example uh, the topo molar topography was combined with the gravity data and both were used to derive the a map of the crustal thickness of mars which is a very important thing if you want to do like uh, some some sort of geodynamic studies or on on uh, extra uh, extra so terrestrial planets and bodies here is a second application this is from one of my own studies that we did a uh, couple of years back here we we found some uh, strange circular features elliptical features in one of the canyons of valles mayores called juventic chasma and these were closed elliptical outcrop patterns that had inward dipping layers that resemble structural basins but i cannot tell that it is a fold or like if it is a fold or uh, what sort of fold it is just by looking at the image so what i had to do was i had to pull out the elevation uh, data and in that elevation data i i, I used it to derive the dips of these limbs and i found that they were both dipping inwards and similarly i carried out this for many other craters and we were able to plot them plot the like uh, uh, and the dips of the axial planes and the plunges of the fold axis in these plots and we were able to make some inferences that were relevant for our study at that time uh, another a few other applications of uh, topography is you can uh, automatically identify stream channels like these these are automatically identified these are not manually drawn so if you give the topography data to uh, the computer and there are some certain algorithms they can immediately uh, identify uh, stream channels depressions and sort of things and from those you can even delineate these catchment areas and watershed analysis and lot of other hydrology stuff also that you could do once you have the topography data and this is not the end of it there are lots of lots and lots of other applications in geodynamics morphoparametric analysis numerical modeling and on and on the list goes so we we'll move on to the next point which is how do you get the topography data since it is so important it's also important to know how we acquire the data first is the laser altimetry it's very simple this is this is the molar that i have been talking about 
uh, for so long mora instrument this this is a this this is a source of laser so this shoots out laser to the surface of a planet it's actually upside down in this image uh, it shoots out laser to the surface of the planet and the laser reflects back and is collected by this collecting telescope over here this is how it is in action so it's basically it determines the range between the instrument and the laser by measuring the round trip time for the laser pulse so the advantages are it's very high resolution uh for global studies and regional studies like it, it gives you kilometer scale uh, resolution which is pretty good for global studies next it is very accurate in fact it is the gold standard and other tems whenever you create those tems yourself you need to tie them to the mola uh, base elevation values then only it is considered uh, legitimate for analysis third is there is one uh, disadvantage that you cannot do with meter scale analysis for example if you are doing if uh, in the previous example the where i was st studying those folds that i was not able to do with the mola because the resolution was quite coarse for that sort of res uh, studies but there is a way around and i will come to come to that in one of the later slides this this you see profile over here is a north to south profile of mars and see a couple of interesting things this point over here is marks the boundary between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere uh, there's a dichotomy it's not actually the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere it's actually a dichotomy on mars that the northern plains of mars are much flatter smoother and the crustal thickness is much less compared to the southern plains so that, that that's the most important dichotomy that we have on mars it's marked by three things a uh, very thin crustal uh, thickness second very smooth surface and also the elevation is much lower for the northern surface as compared to the south so this has been this uh, is is being demonstrated from the mola data how beautiful it you can see it now some of like if you remember from the earlier slide i told you that uh, you cannot see into the surface of venus and uh, what's going on inside uh, underneath those clouds but there is actually a way by uh, but you have to go to a different wavelength range of the electromagnetic spectrum and use radar data using the synthetic aperture radars you can you can find the surfacial features of uh, uh, planetary surfaces that are covered in clouds and and things and sar can also give you like uh, digital elevation models just like you had from the laser altimeter however the resolution is uh, like some uh, not always the same this is from this is a, a map of the venus colorized and it has been converted into the elevation values uh, and it is and it is uh, obtained from the magellan sars in the aperture radar on board the magellan space craft that orbited uh, venus there is also a third way you can find the digital elevation models you can calculate the digital elevation models or rather generate them and that is using stereo photogrammetry if you have a left and a right image of the same target from satellite taken at two different uh, angles you can combine them to get a very accurate estimate of the elevation values however you need to tie this to one of the global dems for example the mola dem that i told you and you can then uh, like carry on very fine scale uh, calculations like layer thickness measurements dips and strikes of layers stress strain calculations and lots of other things so that's all about topography and uh, the the importance next we move on to the surface composition that is also a very important thing that we need to know what the surface is made of what sort of minerals and chemical elements comprise the surface so just like to get an idea of the geophysical geodynamical aspects of planetary surfaces you needed the topography information which was uh, an added dimension so here also you need to add a third dimension but this time it's in the spectral domain you have to add this dimension so reflectance spectroscopy is the most commonly used technique to attain this goal uh, and light in the like ultraviolet visible and uh, the infrared the near infrared that is used for this purpose and the basic principle is that uh, every mineral has its own unique way of interacting with electromagnetic energy and thereby it uh, leaves its characteristic signature in the light that gets reflected off it or uh, this here this plot you see here uh, is a plot of the reflectance spectra of 
different minerals like hematite, <coughs> magnesium bearing olivin, iron bearing olivin, plagioclase, low calcium pyroxene, and high, high calcium pyroxenes. And you can see that they are all characteristic and distinct in their own ways. But uh, how does this actually work? I'll give you a simple demonstration of how this works. Is simple think of the uh, think of it like this. Here is the sun, which is a source of light. The light that comes from the sun is incident on the surface of a planetary body. We have the moon for here, for as, uh, as an example, and it gets reflected off from the uh, planetary su surface after interacting with the materials that were present at that location. Then it is captured by the satellite that is orbiting the planet. And inside the satellite, there are some like instruments, the uh, hyperspectral instruments, where it, inside of which you have again some arrangement that splits the light into the different colors, uh, the color components. And each <coughs> color component is imaged uh, as a separate file and they are all stacked together. After they are all stacked together, as you can see over here, you take the pixel values for every location, some or, uh, one particular location from every of these images and you simply plot it like this against the wavelengths. <coughs> this gives you the reflectance spectra of that material that you were looking at and using the absorption bands where they occur, how deep they are, you can make some relevant uh, interpretations about the <coughs> compositional makeup of the surface. There are two ways of doing this. One is called the multispectral, where you have uh, fewer bands and uh, far and wide apart. So uh, <coughs> these are good for like yeah, <coughs> change detection, global uh, and some global studies because they do not take up a lot of data volume. So the images can be uh, used to map the entire surface of the planets and. Uh, and these are basically basically done based on the band ratios and spectral slopes sort of things. The absorption features are not visible in multispectral images. So you will get some sort of like bar plot like thing like this, as you can see over here. On the other hand, if you come to hyperspectral, the number of bands is not just too many, but they are continuous. Unlike here, here these were not continuous. There were big gaps between these wavelength ranges. That's why it was that's it's, it's called multispectral bands. But in hyperspectral, they are assumed to be continuous. So that instead of plots like these, you have a continuous linear plot like that. And in these linear plots, you can look at the specific locations where absorptions are happening and what sort of absorption it is, how deep it is. You can still do all the things that you are doing with the multispectral, but here you can do it with more uh, uh, rigor. You can also do some advanced things like uh, spectral unmixing, irradiative transfer modeling, and uh, quantitative estimation of uh, mineral abundances, along with the uh, point that you can also identify individual mineral species using hyperspectral, which you are not able to do with multispectral. You can only get an idea of what elements are there, like a broad, vague idea, but Exact elements if you want to know, exact minerals if you want to know, you'll have to come over to hyperspectral. An example is here you have uh, for the hyperspectral, multispectral, you have the Clementine iron map of the moon. And you see that there are these patches which uh, show you the concentrations of iron. But this is a global study and it's quite coarse. However, if you come to hyperspectral, you will see that it's not covering the entire planet. It's only present at a few uh, points all over the surface. But what you can see is that there are different uh, minerals that are identified over here. For example, phyllosilicates, silica, chlorides, carbonates, sulfates, all these you can identify using high, hyperspectral images, but not with multispectral. Multispectral will only give you, the, for example, the iron abundances, as, as shown over here. There are a lot of minerals that you can identify through hyperspectral remote sensing. Uh, igneous minerals like olivines, pyroxenes, and I, different types of ice like water ice, carbon ice, ice. Apart from this, a lot of aqueous minerals are also identified like sulfates, phyllosilicates, carbonates, hydrated silicates, and even organic compounds are also detectable using hyperspectral imagery. Here's an example of how this works. Uh, first, you uh, decide which uh, where you want to do the really carry out the analysis of hyperspectral. And then from the spectral library, your job is to compare the spectra of these elements and see what matches with them. That is a very difficult thing to do if you had millions and millions of pixels. So what you do is you devise some smart way of doing it automatically. One of the, those ways is called summary products where you uh, create some formula that captures the band positions and the depths of the bands. 
and you just run those algorithms on the entire the images and you get maps like these which shows you the element the mineral distribution um, of that the, that location for example this 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 shows you the the yellow yellow thing is kaiserite and the a blue thing is uh, someone no kind most likely and and we had also repeated this work but we had updated the uh, summary parameters and we got a much finer uh, like resolution of uh, the mineral distributions and interestingly you can again bring back the dem that we discussed earlier and you can use these dems to do a 3d rendering of the mineral distribution and then you get wonderful uh, like scientific insights about the distribution of minerals for example you see that uh, the red material the is only present at the higher elevation and it's not there uh, it's dominated by the other mineral in the lower elevations apart from this there are other modes of orbital remote sensing such as thermal remote sensing where you uh, measure the emissivity of a surface uh, in contrast to the reflectance which were, which was like used in the hyperspectral reflectance spectroscopy you get the thermal inertia which will give you the uh, grain sizes and uh, degree of uh, in, in duration uh, of the of the materials you also have uv x ray gamma ray uh, neutron spectroscopy which you can use to study the atmosphere and even get uh, ideas about the elemental composition these are often relying on the uh, high energy particles that come from the solar wind or the cosmic uh, radiations and you also have radar which uh, with which you can uh, ground penetrating radar with which you can study buried bodies of ice glaciers and other biosphere and such things hello 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 uh, hello uh, hello 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 yeah 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 i'll be finishing off uh, in 5 minutes Yeah. So some resources to get you started uh, are like uh, I will I will talk, discuss some of the data sets, the software, and the reading materials that you might find useful. First of all, you have it in your computer already, I guess. Google Earth. If you check Google Earth, there are a few like uh, options on top, and on one of them takes you to the uh, to Mars and Moon. So if you if you for example click on Mars, uh, you will get something like this. And on the left side, if you check, there will be something called a spacecraft imagery. which you can use to check out whatever like images are available for example here i have clicked on the prism images for the locations on uh, valles marineris and uh, and you can you can download the images you can even like uh, check the ctx high rise and there will be very fun and cool thing to try out so that's one thing second if you want to download the data for scientific work you can always go to the planetary data system you can search based on the target or the mission that you are interested in next uh if you are interested only in the inner solar system bodies like the Mar like mars mercury moon and venus you can check out the uh, orbital data explorer there are four mars orbital data explorer is displayed over here it's again on the pds geosciences node and you can easily figure your way like uh, out uh, like uh, how how to get the data and start downloading this this all is free and easily available a third good option is jmars because most of us don't uh, have arcgis arcgis is very expensive jmars is capable of doing a lot of things it has all the data sets available for you and it, you can even do uh, elevation profiling create shape files and many other uh, things that you can check out it's also free a good uh, alternative to arcgis would be uh, qgis because arcgis is very free uh, very expensive uh, Q, qgis you can download and you can uh, start analyzing your uh, data that you will download if you download from the orbital data explorer or the pds using qgis it's pretty st straight forward and there are lots and lots of tutorials online which you can also use then there is usgs isis which is the integrated software for images and spectrometers this is a uh, like host of computer programs that you can do to Uh, uh like a lot of things from spectroscopic analysis to map projections to corrections and uh, this the list is very long uh, you might check out but trying this out is at first it might be a little difficult for those who are not well acquainted with the unix environment because it only runs on linux but it's still worth giving a try and it's very fun and you can even you uh, generate dems if you integrate this with the aim studio pipeline and that would be also a nice exercise but 
you can try it out later some of the software also include coding uh, like uh, languages such as uh, python and matlab because you often have to code things python would be better the better choice because it's free although matlab is also equally good uh, and there are a lot of things that uh, like it will enable you to do once you have these two for example data visualization spectral analysis and you can read the list there, there's lots and lots of things some super cool uh, like uh, things like uh, modeling and simulations are also possible using these software and it's all free if you are interested in research papers you can always go to the astrophysics data system which is uh, available but i'm not sure you will always find the papers because papers are not always free but you can re reach out to our friends or any one of us and we'll help you out if you are it is available with us and lastly here is here are some of the books that uh, you could uh, start uh, reading if you want and this would give you some um, some more ideas on which direction you want to proceed and these are just my favorite books although there's lots and lots of more books and uh, review papers that you must read uh, if you are interested in this field and uh, yeah that's where i would like to leave you for today and uh, i hope to see some of you in this field in the future and uh, let me know if there's something i can help you or any of us the three of us can help you with uh, we'll be always glad to engage with you thank you Uh, thank you, Ramon, for 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 the excellent uh, uh, talk. Um, we have a quick, uh, a quick, few quick questions. Uh, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, Doctor Mishra asked that scientists have already detected water resources on Mars. Can this data, along with other favorable conditions, lead to the habitation of human race on this planet? So, uh, Pr. Pradha, I would like to answer this question. Yeah, sure. Yes, uh, people are thinking about uh, colonizing. I will, I will rather the, use the term colonizing uh, Mars and Moon. Uh, this process, uh, they are thinking it uh, from 1970s. This is not new. And the recent mission, which uh, on which I will be giving my talk, that uh, the Perseverance mission, one of the major objective of the mission is to prepare for human exploration. Okay, prepare for future human exploration. It uh, carries certain instrument uh, that uh, and uh, some technology demonstration programs that uh, that will help us to uh, prepare for uh, future manned mission and driving uh, manned vehicles and also for future astronauts to thrive there. So I will uh, try to um, cover this thing and touch upon these things in my presentation as well. So for now, I could, um, yeah, uh, he has asked another question as well, that uh, can the different geological data be applied to the evolution of Earth as well? Ranjanda? Hello, Shroom. Can you yeah, please... Uh, can you please restate this question once, once again? Yeah, the, just uh, he asked that uh, can the different geological data apply to the geological data? Of yes, sir. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, Ranjanda, the question is uh, can this geological data of Mars uh, be applied uh, for the evolution of Earth? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because on Earth, uh, first of all, one of the most important things is on Earth, you do not have, uh, like, uh, uh, you cannot study every part of the Earth. First of all, it's vegetation covered and a lot of recycling happens because of active tectonism on Earth. However, Mars is tectonically dead for long. So many of the features that had operated way back in the geological past, they are still preserved. And they can be used as analogs to study things on happening on Earth. So yes, uh, that is very important. And secondly, also, since uh, similar processes like uh, winds uh, uh, are operating on Mars and there is no uh, urbanization and vegetation on the planet, so they can you can you can see them in full action. So that that's also one other thing that you can study. The geomorphic processes yeah. in much more detail. Yeah, basically, the uh, Earthian part, the Indian part, in the in the Indian part, 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 the
uh, the Martian period uh, material of, of Mars, so somehow we can tell something about what happened on Earth, uh, on other than on Earth, period before, or uh, earlier period. So in that sense, it's a very, very interesting uh, study the uh, Martian science. I, I, I'd like to add one that the water questions that you asked Dr. Mishra. Uh, see, the liquid water on the surface uh, of Mars is actually the pure state of liquid water. It's actually thermodynamically unstable. So, uh, we're getting clear to the liquid water on Mars right now. However, we have uh, evidence of impure phase of liquid water. Uh, the very good evidence. Okay, the Phoenix Lambda, uh, like the only one. However, we have uh, liquid salty water uh, in subsurface uh, level. So, uh, if you can acquire those uh, the surface water, like uh, the workers from Pierre Lambda, but also last few years, like they have identified uh, a level of water in the surface. Uh, like that, if you, if you can detect the fire horizon or the, the, the area for which uh, liquid water uh, is there, so uh, this radar data, uh, our demonstration data, then uh, we can uh, use those uh, resources for human supply if, if, if needed. Uh, okay, I think we don't have any yeah, more no, okay. so, oh, one more question, one more question. Kausa uh, Chatterjee has asked that in the outer region, what is the proportion of carbon dioxide ice and uh, water ice? And second one, how reverse fault can be identified from satellite satellite images? Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming that uh, uh, coastal is referring to the outer part of the solar system. So yeah, the I think of, I think uh, he's is 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 uh, mentioning about Mars. I think. So, yeah, I think Kosov uh, can unmute and ask directly. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. There are only two questions. Uh, what is in the outer solar region, in the outer solar system, what is the estimated proportion of CO2 ice and H2 ice? And the second is for the Mars image, where the faults can fault or lineaments can be understood, but how? One can assert that this, that's a reverse fault. Does we use right. the data? Right. So uh, in the outer solar system, uh, after you uh, so, like go beyond the first line, where uh, water starts freezing and uh, it, it starts condensing into ice, you uh, first meet this uh, two of the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. So they are mostly hydrogen and helium. But if you go beyond them, you meet the icy giants, which are Uranus and Neptune. So uh, and they. Uh, so it, it goes on increasing because of the temperature and if you go even further beyond the Kuiper the, the Kuiper belt uh, you find lots and lots of water ice however if you compare the Kuiper belt objects with the asteroids the asteroids are mostly silicates and chondrites material so further you go beyond the proportion of water ice keeps on increasing and secondly how reverse faults can be identified from satellite images reverse faults in uh, planetary uh, context are often referred to as wrinkle ridges and that's because they have a very wrinkled appearance. That is the first sign that you might look for, like identifying a reverse fault. Apart from that, whenever you see a linear feature and uh, you're not sure if it is a reverse or a normal fault, you can simply uh, turn to the DEM and the DEM will, uh, in many ways, it, it can uh, tell you whether it's a normal fault or a reverse fault. But mostly uh, on Mars and Moon, reverse faults are seen to have a very wrinkled surface and that's how we call it, it's a reverse fault. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, another question we have here, uh, Nila Hoshet, uh, he asked that uh, is Mars is technologically active and why? Uh, uh, no, I think, active actually, I think. I think, the question oh, was I, I, think I, I have, sorry, 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 sorry. No, he no, asked no, that no. is no. Mars is technologically inactive and why? Most of the uh, uh, reason why some planet goes uh, from tectonically active to inactive is when it starts losing heat and also when it starts losing uh, water for some reason. So these both are very important. For Mars, we have a lot of water, so that's not a problem. But because of its smaller size, it has lost a lot of its heat and that is what led to also the like 
loss of its magnetic field and because of the loss of the magnetic field you also lost the mass also lost the atmosphere which was stripped away by, by the solar wind so all of it is actually related to the amount of heat a body can retain you remember one of the earlier slides i showed you callisto so a similar thing has also happened with callisto the reason it has the oldest surface in the solar system is because it is so far away from jupiter that it does not have tidal uh, stresses on it that can generate heat neither is it big enough and uh, doesn't have enough radio nucleides that can uh, produce internal heat and also it's very far away from the sun so all of this has led to the tectonical like um, end of planets like these which come at a fall at a smaller size okay thanks thanks for explanation uh, So uh, we have one more question. We have one more question. Question. Uh, you can answer it right now, or you can answer after you talk. No, I I think uh, we can cover it, and then okay. I would start my presentation. Uh, okay. Doctor Mishra, cover it, and we will start. Now. Yeah, uh, Doctor Mishra, can you please ask the read out your question? Uh, I couldn't follow right properly. No, whether orbital remote sensing or land rover data of Mars yeah. will be more yeah. accurate. Which which data will be more accurate? Either uh, uh, data, uh, land rover data, or orbital remote sensing data. Uh, so, uh, in science perspective, you can use both, and both are to some extent are accurate. Okay, so okay. the scientists are using uh, as they uh, after various processing of the raw data and calibrating uh, calibration of data, and then uh, the science ready data um, has finally produced. so these data are ac uh, accurate you can use but the problem will be about the uh, extent the spatial extent for uh, uh, remote sensing for orbital data the uh, extent of the data for per pixel or the scene will be that will be covered a huge area and you will get a crude data in uh, comparison to the uh, rover one but uh, for the drawback perspective from a uh, rover data is it can traverse uh, of up to a few kilometers okay you cannot uh, generate a map or you cannot study a uh, uh, global area on the regional basis regional area yeah Because, yeah uh so i think i should uh, start my presentation right on yes uh, yes yeah with all of your per uh, permission i am just sharing my screen okay yeah Yeah, is this visible? Yeah, but sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Now, uh, very good afternoon to you, uh, Doctor uh, Divedita Chakraborty and uh, Mrs. Indani Mondal has already introduced us, uh, all of us. But uh, let me um, say a few words about myself. I'm Shubham Sharkar. um completed my bsc and msc from presidency university kolkata and uh, then secured the dst inspire fellowship and joined the space application center uh, um, it's a uh, institute of um, in isro so <clears throat> under the guidance of uh, mr shwetadru bhattacharya he is present here and uh, he is a student of uh, durgapur government college uh, and uh, taught by dr maji and dr uh, mahabatra and uh, now i am about to submit my phd thesis on spectroscopic and geochemical characterization of martian analog minerals from different parts of indian subcontinents uh, although my main focus of research is to study the hot springs related mineralogy and their astrobiological implications uh, it will this work will also help in future sensor development and to find these minerals on the uh, to uh, find these minerals on the different planetary bodies so uh, you can think that i use two words that may be hard to follow for some of you like uh, astrobiology and sensor development uh just be patient at the end of this presentation i think you will get to know what these words mean so mainly uh, today i will be talking about the recent rover mission by nasa which is still currently working on the surface of mars that is the perseverance rover and uh, as uh, this talk is mainly intended for um, uh, targeted to the bsc students i 
have tried to be as lucid as possible and to engage the young minds to the uh, subject of planetary science. Uh, let us start. So here is mainly the recent Mars missions by NASA. Uh, in the upper part, you could see the orbiter missions. Uh, already uh, Rajanda has told the difference between the orbiter and the rover missions and the lander missions. So here is the Mars Odyssey, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Maven uh, Orbiter, the ESA Stress Gas Orbiter, and uh, also the rover instruments like Opportunity, Curiosity, the Insight Lander, and the Perseverance is the main focus of this talk. And the ESA ExoMars rover, it is uh, destined to go in future. But uh, just focus on the lower portion. Okay. So here it's the evolving Mars science themes over the years. It's not like that these themes are uh, generated in this uh, time frame, but all these missions, they try to follow this Mars science team. So why to send this? Okay. These missions. Like first, the um, uh, Mars science theme was to follow the water on Mars. Then uh, they, uh, people are sanguine about the water availability on Mars using the opportunity data and the, the curiosity over data. Then they started exploring the habitability perspective. Is Mars, uh, was Mars habitable on the past or is it is uh, habitable till now? So for that, the curiosity started working on that basis and Perseverance is uh, carrying forward this uh, work too. And when the um, uh, habitability perspective is achieved, then people try to seek signatures of life. So you naturally could see the uh, uh, seeking biosignatures preservation potential for the different parts of Mars. So mainly perseverance is working on um, uh, to uh, explore the habitability perspective and um, seeking signs of life on Mars. So all these missions, all these missions, they are... Uh, um, hidden objective in all of this is to prepare for human explorations on the red planet so coming to the next point why to send rovers why to invest uh, in rover missions as mars science can be achieved using telescopic and orbiter based instruments so already dr sarkar has already discussed about the basic limitations of uh, orbiter based platforms first of all it can cover the whole surface of the planet but the spatial extent is too coarse. Okay, for example, the average resolution of a multispectral instrument is 20 to 30 meters. That means each pixel of a satellite image from that sensor is of 20 to 30 meter in length and width. So the data from a 30 meter uh, pixel, a 30 meter grid is represented in, uh, in one pixel of your computer. So for global map production, this is quite handy no doubt about it but as a geologist we not only need to see some old and crude map prepared by the previous workers but yes they can uh, help us to understand the general association of lithology and the structural aspects of the area of interest but to start with you need to carry out a field work okay you have to go to the field measure the structural orientations understand the basic lithology and finally collect the samples for further studies in land. So the Perseverance rover will do all of this for us. So we cannot go there as of now. So we sent the robot geologist on Mars. Uh, fine, we sent the rover, but where it will land? So as we can cover a maximum of few kilometers with a rover, so landing sites will uh, must be precisely determined. In this image, you can see the past landing sites of um, Martian rovers. So this is basically a topography map. Um, uh, already Priya Pratoda and uh, Ranjanda both have shown and referred to this map. So I just mentioned a few points. Thus, these blue areas are the lowlands and the red areas are the highlands. And here. The highest point of the on Mars, the highest point of the entire solar system, that is the Olympus moons. Okay, so it's uh, coming up, uh, giving you the red and it's even the white color. Okay, because of its size, it's uh, um, uh, more than 20 kilometers of um, uh, high from the Martian data. So, 
you could see a distinct difference between the northern lowland and the southern highland but in case of earth we could find um, all the continental landmass is towards the northern hemisphere and the in southern hemisphere mostly this is covered by ocean but uh, so the general depression is from north to south in case of earth for mars it is quite reverse so this area the greenish area here is called the martian dichotomy okay this is the uh, it is the um, um, juncture between the southern highland and the northern lowland and except from for two landing missions by nasa that phoenix and viking the all the other missions uh, are targeted in these areas only okay so i am restricted uh, this um, presentation um, um, Uh, mainly to the uh, past and present um, rover and orbiter sent to uh, by nasa people but uh, apart from that uh, isro has achieved um, a tremendous goal that uh, it sent a uh, orbiter mission for for the for, uh, on in, on their first chance the mission on mars the mangalyaan mission uh, but uh, here i wanted to show you the ongoing mars science perspective view so i took uh, these um, uh, missions they are um, actually linked to one another okay so well, so coming to the point so why to choose this um, dichotomy boundary because this area as they show the latitudinal differences they can show you some uh, they can pro uh, provide you with rocks from the highland as well that are carried by any uh, agent to the lowland and also the um, may, uh, the original rocks of the lowland areas and it is um, can it can also give you the window to search the different sedimentary layers as pure brother so in his presentation the sedimentary strata the, uh, we can study them to understand the past geological activities there okay so uh, after that so, okay fine now we have uh, targeted this um, dichotomy boundary and for perseverance we have targeted a crater called the zozero crater so this is zozero crater and um, here in the left the, the, the rover is destined to land on the left side as uh, you could see in this in, uh, interactive video here so <clears throat> yeah it landed on the left portion the e ellipse you are seeing here the uh, the circle is the term the landing ellipse the rover is destined to land the center of this mark and um, it may land anywhere within the elliptical area due to some technical issues but the white line is anticipated trajectory and the blue line here is the um, river flowing from the no uh, left side the western side and deposited the sediments in the form of delta okay so the, the crater was once uh, a basaltic surface then the impact happened and the crater formed and then um, um, on the uh, crater it the river from left deposited um, some sediments and uh, this lake on this lake and from this delta so here in the false color composite image you could see the mineralogical variations of zozero crater so the yellowish and greenish area are comprised of olivine and carbonate rocks and the sedimentary layers of the delta region is greenish to purple in color and the same, um, the, the older crater floor unit that is comprised of the altered basaltic layers that is mainly the smectite rich clays and phyllosilicate minerals they are pretty much brownish in color in this map okay so okay let us see how the rover had landed so the procedure of the landing uh, was um, based on three distinct um, first that the um, detachment of the parachute deployment of the parachute and then uh, he will be seeing the detachment of the huge shield itself uh, below the rover and um, after the that deployment of the sky screen thruster 
that helped the rover for targeted smooth landing. You can see the lower rover at the lower left co corner of this video and uh, suspended with the help of three cables from the thruster. And the upper left video is shot from directly from the rover in upward direction. Okay. And after the rover successfully touched down, the suspension cable detached and the thruster flew away and crash landed on somewhere on Martian surface. So I just kept this video in this presentation to give you a glimpse of the power of humanity. This is not any CGI generated image or any uh, scene taken from uh, Marvel movies. This is something people have done on an, um, an alien planet. Okay. So fine. So it has landed successfully on the surface of Mars. But why? For what purpose? So much time, so much money has been invested. What the rover will do? Uh, here are the basic objectives of the rover that is ought to be fulfilled uh, uh, during its working tenure, achieving which the mission will be declared as success. So like the first two um, objectives are geology and astrobiology, like to study the rocks and landscape at the landing site to reveal the region's history. And secondly, to determine whether an area of interest was suitable for life and to look for signature of ancient life future. Okay. And the third and most important um, objective of this mission is to sample catching. For the first time from Martian surface, people are trying to uh, dig a core and collect core samples and that will be returned to Earth in successive missions. Okay, by um, the first half of uh, 2030, uh, it is planned that this mission will make uh, these samples will be returned to Earth for further analysis. And last but not the least, the mission has a hidden objective as I already said that prepare for human missions to test certain technologies that will help sustain human presence on Mars and someday in future. Okay. So um, how to achieve these goals? So how to, um, to um, this uh, Perseverance rover will fulfill its objective? Here are the main instruments of the rover that uh, carries with it and uh, some of it um, for the, um, achieving the geology and astrobiological perspective like this pixel instrument, okay, that is on the robotic arm. So this pixel instrument is nothing but an X-ray fluorescence. Uh, you all heard about XRF. This is a field-based XRF machine. And this Sherlock instrument. The Sherlock and with it, it carries with it a camera called Watson. So this Sherlock is a Raman spectrometer. And there is an uh, instrument to... Um, analyze the Martian weather that is called MEDA and the most important of it, uh, the, our um, focus of interest right now is the SuperCam. So it is uh, amalgamation of six to seven instruments. It has uh, um, two, basically two hyperspectral sensors. One will be capturing data from the visible region of the in, uh, um, electromagnetic spectrum and uh, another will be for the uh, IR domain. So 1.3 micrometer to 2.6 micrometer. And um, it has a laser-induced background spectra, the Leeds spectrometer, and it also carries a Raman of its own, and along with um, a thermal luminescence um, spectrum spectrometer, and it carries a microphone to capture the Martian sounds. Okay. And another interesting instrument is the Rimfax, this ground-penetrating radar. It will give a glimpse of the subsurface of Mars. Mars. And it has a total number of 23 cameras, 23 cameras, believe it or not, 23 cameras, two of which are clubbed and called the mast cam Z. So in American pronunciation, Z is pronounced as Z. So I'm referring is the uh, uh, mast cam Z. So these two here, one here and one here, these are the left and right mast cam Z cameras. The stunning imagery is you see, uh, I will be showing you some of them. So they are mainly captured by the mast cam Z. Okay, so with this uh, in scientific instrument, they will uh, do this rover will pursue its uh, geological and astrobiological objectives, but for human exploration, what it will do? So it carries an instrument called MOXIE. It can produce oxygen from Martian carbon dioxide. 
so you all know that martian um, atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide so it's purely i could say the purely made up of carbon dioxide so if uh, further human exploration are planned in future so it, it will be quite impossible to carry such a load of oxygen to sustenance of um, human explorers there so we have to make our, um, oxygen from the atmospheric carbon dioxide so the moxi will uh, do that and try to achieve uh, uh, sustainable amount of um, oxygen production before human exploration could be think of so <clears throat> next another aspect of this mission is the ingenuity helicopter here you are seeing the footage of the first flight of ingenuity okay so human has successfully flown an aircraft over a different planet after more than 100 years of first flight by Wright brothers um, and uh, for to give homage to Wright brothers um, the helicopter this ingenuity helicopter carries a piece of cloth from the first aeroplane winged by uh, them okay and it's a good thing to mention that the chief engineer of this mars helicopter project is of indian origin his name is mr bob balaram alumni of um, iit madras so next uh, the sample catching procedure okay so one of the main objective of perseverance rover is to collect sample for future return in this animated video you could see the step by step processes of sample collection by the rover's robotic arm here the drill core has been captured and then it will be transferred to the sealing compartment okay uh, yes it is transferring to the sealing compartment right now it's going to yeah so the sample um, core is has been sealed and it will be stored in the sample cache unit and these samples will be kept on mars before 2030 these samples will be returned with the help of two subsequent missions okay so as of now total number of eight core samples of 1.3 cm uh, diameter and 6 cm in length have been collected so all of who are following the mission from very beginning like us so we were pretty excited about the sample catching procedure but uh, it will be the because it will be the first time the martian rocks can be analyzed here on earth Okay. Although there are some meteorites that are thought to be coming from Mars, but uh, it will be first time uh, the samples, the physical samples that are that will be coming from Mars. But to the surprise of everyone, the everyone, the first sample collection operation has failed. No sample could be recovered by the first drilling process. Uh, it was made to the headlines of the scientific news portals. People were everywhere was talking about it. everybody was startled by the non recovery of the first sample code collected by perseverance so here in the left image you could see the remote remote micro imager photograph that is hosted on the super cam it's nothing but a, a zoomable lens the zoom lens it can close uh, it has a very close range view uh, it's a, i could say is a macro macro lens okay macro camera so this uh, remote micro imager image so you could see a portion of the drill core at the uh, bottom of the drill hole here okay and uh, on the right is the mast cam z image um, where you could definitely identify the drill cone that is generated by the dr drilling process itself okay so what happened to the first uh, sample um, that was um, tried by perseverance to collect so we dug up and we uh, oh shit ha huh. we dug up and came up with this um me and one of my senior narayan bosh from iit kharagpur we worked at the it and from we got time to time input and mentorship from satadu bhattacharya has already mentioned his name and dr subhash pandey my guide of my phd thesis so they helped me a lot they helped us me and narayan a lot uh, on this and what did we do okay we started analyzing the super cam and leaves data and uh, came up with these results what are these so in the left panel 
So you can see some remote micro imager photographs near to the first drilling site. Okay, there are um, uh, nearly um, all these all these images are taken nearly a meter to um, a few meters uh, apart um, from each other, uh, circling this drill hole. So here in the red circles are the IR spectral points, and the green crosshairs that, that show here is the laser induced breakdown spectrometer data collection points. So in the middle. Um, portion. This is the IR uh, spectra from these points, these uh, six points. Okay. Please mute your microphone. Migango, I think. Please mute your microphone. Okay. Uh, so, in the middle, the IR spectra. In this panel uh, at the bottom, this is the USGS spectral library of the minerals and above are the spectra from Mars surface itself. And we matched them to and came up with that these minerals, these, these uh, rocks here are nothing but snake type minerals. Okay. These are aluminium rich clay minerals and somewhat uh, iron and magnesium rich and these data uh, fits well with the laser induced um, breakdown spectrometer data, the LIBS uh, peaks. And this is a quite handy instrument that can give the elemental abundance of any surface uh, with the help of a laser beam. Okay. And um, so uh, we are getting a gross idea about the um, mineralogy with the help of this um, IR spectrometer. And we can pinpoint the mineralogy by this LIBS data. So no big deal there. Okay. So in the previous slide, I have already shown you that what we have done. The whole work was done without taking any help from the rover instrument team. As outsider, we are able to do that. So because the data and all other related information like how to process and use the data is freely available. Okay. You just need to have just a little prior knowledge of the subject and to uh, knowledge about the data um, manipulation and data visualization procedure. So in the next few slides, I will be showing you where to get this information about different instruments and about the data downloading and visualization processes. The, uh, though Ranjanda has uh, covered it up uh, in a little, but uh, I will uh, just uh, go a uh, further detail in, in respect to the perseverance rover so that you could work on the rover data on your own. Okay. So here, just you have to go to the um, site, the pbsgeosciences.wustl.edu. Um, uh, so next, uh, if you click this link, it will be redirected to the PBS Geosciences node. So first of all, you get some information uh, about the data and the recent data that will be published in future. Okay, and uh, here you can get uh, uh, many um, other links to uh, download not only Mars from Venus, Mercury, Moon, Earth, Earth data as well. So if you click Mars, then the historical Ma Martian data all are freely available here, the starting from the Mariner data. Okay, then Viking, um, Lander, Orbiter, the Mar Mars. Earth, um, Finder rover, and um, like this Curiosity data also. So let us click the Perseverance rover here. So here the main page of the Perseverance rover's data are in PDS. Uh, in the this left panel the, that is um, uh, highlighted in green, these are the basics of the, uh, the highlights of the instrument itself. Let us see that what uh, the super cam holds for us. So here you can find the design and the um, location of the super cam on the instrument itself. So if you scroll down, you could get um, the basic information about the mass, power, volume of the instrument. And then uh, you get to uh, see the picture and um, of this man, the Roger Wills. So he is basically the principal investigator of this super cam instrument. So for any data and science related question, you can easily uh, ask him 
uh, and um, any of his team members they will help you i think so uh, not only super cam like this uh, you can also click to different and browse to different instruments to get the basic idea about the instrument okay so let us get back to the data portion so in this um, uh, area the highlighted in blue here is the uh, mainly the uh, data in the, under the head of pds bundles the data from different instruments you could get here so let us enter the supercam bundle so here you would see the introduction to the supercam archive bundle that is a text file that will just to for the that readme takes the, uh, to start with it, with the data processing and all the uh, processes and for different instrument you will get the calibrated data and the derived data okay so this calibrated data these are science ready and the derived data these are the data where the preliminary science objectives has been fulfilled on the data and then they are releasing it okay so you can um, to start from scratch you can use the calibrated data and you also can use the derived data product also but this raw data uh, they, uh, you can see this raw data portion so raw data needs some calibration and validation and all of this information can be found on this bundle okay so there is a uh, volume a, a huge pdf file called the uh, supercam users in uh, user guide so where you will get every information that you need there and another interesting thing if you scroll down under the tools menu we could find a march 2020 analyst notebook okay so let us click here first of all it will ask for your email address and password so you could always bypass it by clicking the anonymous link and continue without signing in and then you will get to see this uh, window so here not only perseverance you could uh, visualize and work on and download data from apollo missions as well the apollo the l class mission from moon the phoenix lander the upper uh, spirit opportunity lander the curiosity rover inside lander and also the perseverance rover data okay so uh, what's next the basic idea about the mission can be uh, viewed here also then the uh, in this uh, tab you could get the interactive map where perseverance is right now so this number um, like 127 129 131 these are the martian day okay so when perseverance started its journey it will be marked as 1 and then uh, within the time to time it will be get um, highlighted uh, and get increasing so we term the martian day as sol okay one day is one sol so for mars i will be uh, referring to sol now so if you scroll up and down with your mouse you can hover with this map interactive map and get to see where the rover is as of right now and uh, if you are getting the data from exactly which point the data is coming so let us see the data from different sols you could click here and directly type the number of the sol Uh, in this button but okay so you are getting the sol number 299 at last so uh, the data as of now the sol up to 2 uh, 299 sol the first uh, 299 days of data has been public um and then we could browse that data and browse different sol so let us just see uh, a random date like 157 okay so here is the first is the overview update like here in the highlighted with yolo what it did it drove then some rimfax data was collected some helicopter data transferred to the rover and for transferring uh, to art itself because the helicopter for the uh, size and weight purpose they were restricted their um, Uh, weight to one point have to restrict the weight of the helicopter probe to 1.8 kilograms and so there is no uh, data transfer procedure or uh, hardware can be kept there so the data to be relayed to the rover itself 
and the rover then transfers it to Earth. Okay, then the most important thing what it did is the targeted remote sensing. Okay, so under the targeted remote sensing, these are the data from the data number of data from different instruments. The SC is the super cam, but I was mentioned um, earlier. So from super cam, a total number of 77 data have been generated. And then this MZ is the mass cam Z. So total number of 220 images has been captured from mass cam Z. So we cannot call anyone in a selfie freak, uh, one of our... Uh, we all have some friends like uh, who used to capture image and to upload to Instagram, but Barcelona is not less than that. So it can capture a number, staggering number of 220 images a day. Okay, so okay, jokes apart, but uh, this uh, under this document, this upload link and the download link. These are the two main, very crucial thing for any rover and not only rover, any planetary and any mission to try. Okay, like if you uh, have gone to field, your teacher has briefed at the very beginning of a field work, very uh, uh, every morning that what we will do and this. We will uh, traverse through this uh, countryside and uh, come across these dogs and then we will collect some data here and there and then we will collect these samples. And after that, after the day's work, you will have to submit a resume. So first, the, uh, the thing what the teacher has told you at the very morning of a field work is the uplink. And then you are submitting the resume. This is the downlink. Okay, fine. So uh, at, at every data collection or operational procedure, people just upload um, uh, certain things that uh, to the rover uh, handling procedure that you have to do such works. And then after all the work has been completed, it will generate a report and relate to art itself. Okay, let us just jump to the data products. So here you could see uh, the data products. And you could easily identify the instrument behind it that this um, ME is the MEDA and the SC is the uh, super cam and MZ is for stands for mass cam Z. All the informations are available. So let us see an image from mass cam Z. So let us click here and it will be like this. So this is the calibration target of the mass cam camera. Okay. So um, you have to calibrate the data, uh, the instrument each time you are uh, collecting any data. Like, I just give you a small example about the calibration process. So, you see these colored um, uh, dots here? These are solid colors and the RGB profile of these colors are known to us. Okay. So, when a data is captured, then the uh, people try to match the RGB profile of these areas with the known values, with their known values. So that's how the whole image can be color corrected. So like this is a raw version of an image. So this is not properly color corrected. So you are getting a grainy and a black and white look of a mass cam Z image. But after the calibration uh, is done, you will get a stunning, beautiful uh, um, photograph, a colored photograph of Martian output from this image too. So next, let us um, move to uh, some nav cam data. That is the navigation camera. Okay. So it can also give you idea about the association of general geology. So this nav cam and the pan cam, uh, this sorry, not pan cam, but the mast cam, the both can capture stunning panchromatic, uh, stunning panoramic images, which Pio Bodhara has already sh uh, showed us one from Kiro City Rover. So this nav cam image, oh, so it, sorry, this is from Parsi Evidence, no? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, I'll finish. So, next, the data download process. Always you can, yeah, in uh, here, in the quick download button, you can download the data from here. And not only that, this is the main data product file, 
and the level file, the header, the information about the data, and the quick look JPEG and PNG images to, to just to visualize. These are not the science ready files. The science ready file we will get from this data product file here. Okay. So these are the IR spectroscopic data here, but um, unfortunately, as this is not a conventional camera, this is the spectrometer kind of thing. So no thumbnail can be generated as of now, right here. Mm, like this, previously we are seeing the IR spectroscopic data. Next, the visible uh, uh, data is here. You can always jump to this and click, and just the these data are just one click away from you. So, to end my presentation, let us watch a video of Martian eclipse uh, captured by the Perseverance rover itself using the Mascam Z camera. It is one of the moon of Mars, that is Phobos, passing the sun. So, that's all everyone. Thanks for your patience. And for any help uh, needed regarding data visualization and interpretation and any other thing, feel free to contact me through my email. I will try to answer your queries to the best of my knowledge. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much, Shubham, for the yeah. beautiful presentation. Uh, I just uh, have a question. Any of uh, you can answer it. Uh, I'm asking just as a layman, okay? So forgive me if, uh, if it is seems silly. Uh, would you mind to explain uh, regarding the presence of water in Mars in the past and why uh, it is... Uh, Actually, now at present, the atmosphere of Mars is thin, I think. So the pressure condition is not permissible uh, for the stable liquid water. So uh, my question is, what may be the reason behind uh, this change of the atmosphere? Uh, you are saying or scientists are saying that water was present image of deltas are coming but at present the atmosphere is not uh, stable and thermodynamically it is not actually possible so what would be the possible reason for this transition or this kind of thing? Uh, brother, i think you are the best person to answer this You are muted. Clear the, clear the, clear the, just unmute. However, this is, uh, you are not clearly audible. You are not clearly audible. Hello. Hello. Much better now. Much better now. Yeah. So the period phase of liquid water actually uh, 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 somebody dynamically unstable on the phase in the surface of Mars. However, the interior phase of water uh, like for say brine and all this stuff, but it is uh, still now not detected. Uh, but uh, we have some evidences uh, of uh, droplets of water on the, the Phoenix rover, uh, the Glendon plates. Uh, okay. uh, your question is that, uh, yeah, obviously, that water was there on Mars in ancient time, uh, it was actually flooded. Mars was flooded with water. We, can, we have uh, beautiful evidences of very uh, network and channel fields and how it has uh, disappeared, how all this has been gone. But I think Raman has uh, 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 already a good new answer before, because that, uh, Mars actually lost its uh, internal dynamo. And he did it with uh, 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 the dynamo, uh, this uh, uh, negative field, all this thing, 
uh, 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 yeah, Shwato Jodha is here. Yeah, uh, I don't have any questions for you, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to see if I am I may allow to do so, to talk to my first uh, Dr. Asif Baji and Dr. Uh, Samiran Mahapatra. Paramiri. Hello, how are you? Hello, sir. Thank you, Shwato Dhu. How are you, sir? Fine. How are you? We are all, we are all fine. Fine, sir. Awesome. Awesome. Today, after a long time, uh, we could meet you virtually. Yes, how are you, sir? Actually, I am on my way to Hamarbati uh, railway station. I have to catch a train. But uh, since uh, Subham told me that uh, it will be hosted uh, by uh, uh, this institute, and I immediately told him that the uh, assessor will be there. And it is great to see that the Sangam is also joined. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, you Shakatruda, uh, for joining and, uh, us. Uh, Nivita, for uh, your questions, uh, I would like to add a few things what already appeared the time. Yeah, okay. of course. In fact, uh, what Ranjan told is that the primary uh, reason behind the using of atmosphere is the size of the mass itself because that drives that it that quickly to uh, the outer core, the liquid core, but uh, solidified uh, quite quickly as compared to that of R, which uh, gives rise to the uh, I mean, almost uh, the application of the magnetosphere, uh, which was once upon a time existed at the very early phase. Okay. And therefore, the Martian atmosphere was in constant touch with the toxic phase and solar phase. And because of this high energy particle interactions, there are uh, uh, very speedy dissociations of the atmospheric uh, molecules, CO2 transforming into CO and then it's uh, losing further the oxygen. And this is the process uh, which is continuously happening and uh, it is uh, even, even speeding up uh, the day by day. Now, uh, another interesting aspect is that uh, we always face this kind of questions that a country like India or some other countries uh, for that matter, why you should take care of uh, planetary sciences? Okay. Or uh, why should we invest so much of money behind uh, understanding what is happening to Mars or maybe Venus? And the simple reason of doing this is that we would like to understand as uh, all the human beings on Earth that in future where we are heading to whether our fate is like Mars or it is like Venus so are, I, uh, are we going to be a greenhouse uh, gas dominated uh, planet and therefore uh, no life can thrive on such a planet or we are also going to um, uh, see like a Martian kind of situations dying of the planet slowly and uh, losing the magnetosphere with uh, of course due course of time. So these are uh, very challenging prospects. ISRO is supporting uh, all the um, what is called uh, universities, universities and academics to participate in their programs and we have a strong uh, presence through various uh, public outreach programs. We have at Space Application Center, I can tell you, there are uh, certain uh, things, some training programs for students, things called trees. But uh, we would love to see if any student, uh, after qualifying a uh, NET uh, fellowship, basically, if they want to take uh, planetary science as a career, then they are most welcome to uh, 
come to any of the uh, Canadian Science Institutes uh, in India, including of course the PL is retained in that and also the education continues to be in that. So, uh, once again I would like to thank uh, and it is a great opportunity for me being a student of geology and to interact with my sirs after quite some time. Even though I would have to, I mean I would have been much uh, happier to sometimes visit by in person and uh, I would like to invite each one of you whenever uh, time to uh, get some time to come to Space Education Center and uh, we have a very good uh, exhibition also and uh, kids will like it. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Buddha, for you. the invitation and all of you. Thank you, sir. Um, Dumanita, I have two options. Yes, sir. Yeah. This for uh, Ranjan, your talk was very nice. And it's a very good fundamental concept. I am not an expert on remote sensing. I am not an expert on remote sensing in GIS. However, I would like to know, normally we use digital library of hyperspectral curves to identify a minerals. Right? So how this, this fits into the natural specimens, which is a complex composition? Sorry, what was that? What was the last thing? How best this uh, hyperspectral signatures fits for a natural specimens, which is having a complex compositions? Okay. So, uh, this, uh, like mostly for silicates, what you have, uh, the molecules vibrate, the molecules rotate and turn, and also you have electrons that transit between different energy levels inside the atoms. So all of this have very unique absorptions and uh, uh, like uh, emissions at specific wavelengths. So these are like uh, like like the DNA you can say you can like track uh, track track which specimen uh, it's coming from. So it's very like accurate also and effective that uh, you don't have to spend a lot of chemicals or anything for doing that chemical analysis. You can simply take a photo at different wavelengths and based on the reflectances at different wavelengths you can infer what process is going on like uh, crystal free transitions or molecular vibrations and rotations and from that also you can, you can easily uh, deduce what sort of minerals is there. Sometimes you may not be able to tell which specific mineral is there but what sort of group is present for example a sulfate or a carbonate or a, or a hydroxyl group all those you can quite easily infer from the hyperspectral instruments. Okay. Uh, so now that I have a individual Yeah sir. So, uh, Ranjanda. Yeah. Yeah uh, Ranjanda let me answer this. Uh, sir, uh, you are asking about the um, getting signatures of uh, individual minerals from a complex rock by the hyperspectral yeah. uh, data. No. So, yeah. there are a, yeah. uh, some process that are called um, uh, linear or non-linear unmixed. Okay. There, mm -hmm. um, what we do that uh, we uh, try to um, start with some um, the spectra of individual minerals and then try to uh, mix them in uh, proportion. That is uh, calculated in mathematically. Okay, we just mixing not the samples. We are mixing the spectra and try to achieve the um, ultimate go, um, spectra that is we are getting from the rock itself. So by okay. this, by this mixing and uh, unmixing methods, you could um, uh, not you will uh, get that hundred percent what um, uh, pinpoint that these and these and these minerals are there, but you will get an idea to what are the constituent minerals. So you are getting a complex spectra and then you can easily unmix it with certain uh, physical and mathematical parameters to find the individual in members. Okay. So subsequently you will validate with the field sample analysis. Yes, sir. That, that is m m uh, must have been done. That is the basic okay. key. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions from the uh, students? Students, scholar. Students, please ask questions. Any kind of question you may ask.
निवेदिता भी आई थिंक विश मे हम्म 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 पता है सर है ना सॉरी ये सर है ना एडवांसमेंट इन यूजिंग रिमोट सेंसिंग टू अंडरस्टैंड सब सरफेस स्ट्रक्चर्स बाय एक्सट्रापोलेटिंग द सरफेस स्ट्रक्चर्स हेलो प्लेटफॉर्म you may keep it in a airborne yeah, platform and uh, these days very high uh, means uh, space bond is yeah, not possible in fact there are two instruments on mars one is sarad and the other other one is masi masi so actually the mars of this uh, they are basically very low frequency in uh, uh, ground penetrating radar uh, space bond radar and it can penetrate quite up to some levels and then and uh, in fact uh, very nice work Uh, has come out on the polar layer deposits of Mars using this kind of ground penetrating radar. And uh, in, at Space Exploration Center, we develop our own ground penetrating radar. And in fact, uh, one such uh, ground penetrating radar will be flown both in uh, ISRO JAXA lunar polar exploration mission very recently. I mean, it will be flown in 2023-2024 in time. And uh, similar kind of an instrument is approved uh, already for. India's first lunar mission, and uh, all these instruments are being uh, built uh, by Space Exploration Centre here in Andhra. So yes, it is a very interesting tool, and uh, the cost of this quite high. Once uh, I mean, if you are interested to look into the subsurface structures, but of course there are certain limitations, and uh, knowing those limitations, we need to analyze. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, not in wave. One question in the inbox: How to do flood assessment of a delta A area in a planetary body using remote sensing? Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, to do the okay, Shubham, you want to answer this? No, 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 no. I was oh. referring to you. I hey, go ahead. No, no. I was referring to you. I ah, okay. So, uh, uh, what you do is uh, you need the topographic data. From the topographic data, you have a series of uh, uh, procedures that you do to derive these uh, uh, the slope maps and the uh, digital elevation models are like uh, uh, the ch ch flow lines and where the water will finally move to uh, watershed area. All these delineations you do, and these. In, if you want to do this by hand, it would be very difficult. So there are some uh, algorithms which look for these. Uh, they they will uh, tell you where exactly the water would accumulate. And after you have all this data, then comes the interpretation part where you uh, fix the boundaries and you uh, decide uh, what sort of uh, water will uh, like uh, whether it would accumulate or it will flow past that area or whether it will not even flow into that direction. So all those uh, you can do. um uh, if we don't have any more question uh, i think we should conclude uh, at this point what do you think priya brother the i think uh, hello priya brother are you there i think uh, you may say a few words here yeah, yeah. the link will be available uh, till 7 pm and we have uh, to take okay. some student feedback or uh, vote of thanks so priya so, brother yes. uh, please uh, say a few words and then we would conclude for the technical session 
निवेदित दी आई थिंक यू पुट द माइक्रोफोन इज नॉट वर्किंग सो ओके ओके देन यू कैन से हिज इंटरनेट यस हिज इंटरनेट इज गॉन सो ओ ओ ओ सो देन यू और रंजन मे यस आई विल टेक द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू लाइक दैट so first uh, we just want to i behalf of priya pratoda and ranjan da i want to thank you all to invite us and to patiently um, uh, listen to us to our presentation to our little effort here so uh, and another thing we just wanted to share the there is a uh, to mainly to the students to the young students that there are a vast opportunity ahead in the domain of planetary science so as shatadru the already mentioned the uh, rather prefer shatadru sir has already mentioned that uh, in the domain of planetary so people can come and join with um, in, in the um, in the domain of phd research so after completing their msc in geology or physics rather so they can join to work freely in planetary science not only in remote sensing uh, what i am doing is purely the field based geological um, analysis uh, and that is mainly uh, termed uh, um, as the analog studies which is also a very interesting branch of planetary science also so there are a good opportunity in research domain and also it's a good career opportunity uh, many many um, private um, um, organizations that are now um, coming forward to do space research and space explorations that are um, taking um, freshers um, as workers so this is a good domain to work on after completing your masters and another thing i want to answer the um, share that um, from on behalf of we three we would like to get a, a student feedback form so that will be shared via you nivedita ji so we yeah. can uh, just um, you just make them uh, fill it up and you can send okay, okay 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 i i will send with their uh, certificates and they will okay. send you the feedback okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, you. thank you that's all thank friends. you very thank you very much to all of our resource person it was a wonderful experience for us uh, i would now likely um, to approach our students if they like to uh, give some feedback on the this workshop any of you if you are interested then uh, you can say something no i want to say something uh introduce yourself myself sorin my name first year from bsc undergraduate in geology from kgr dc college okay at first i want to thank our respected professors and thanks to our kgr dc college members for arranging this knowledgeable workshop from this uh, workshop i had gathered knowledge about fundamentals of planetary sciences sciences it shows how principles and equations learned in introductory geology classes can be applied to study many aspects of planets including dynamics surfaces and interiors it also includes the discovery and characterizations of extrasolar planets i am very much interested in that type of future works thank at last i want to thanks to everyone everyone for your kind attention it will be a remarkable seminar i will i would like to kjdc college request kjdc college to keep arranging this type of seminar afterwards okay thank you very much shorin uh, anyone else i want to say something Uh, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. I am Apurva Dev, student of second year from the Department of Geology. I would like to share a few words regarding my experience on attending the workshop. Uh, we got to know about the planetary environment within which the planets were formed, uh, how they have reacted and interacted, especially of the planet Mars. I would rather say the satellite images that we have seen were really amazing. Uh, like we have never seen any such image before anywhere in internet and. Uh, we also got to know about the recent planetary missions that are going on and the development of new techniques that are giving better insights of the solar system overall it was an amazing experience attending the workshop as we got to know so much about the solar system and things associated with it and i would rather say the knowledge that we have gathered from this workshop will definitely help us in our future studies 
and uh, lastly i would like to express my honest gratitude and thankfulness to all the speakers thank you everyone thank you very much apurva and uh, now i would like to invite uh, our final semester student orpita pandey to give the vote of thanks orpita are you here पांडे I would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed delegates and participants of the workshop for their patience and contribution to make this event a great success. Uh, during this uh, one-day international online workshop on the fundamental of planetary science, we got an overview on uh, certain uh, research method, technique, application, and most importantly, the uh, future career scopes in this highly prospecting uh, research field. I extend I extend my uh, sincere gratitude to our respected officer in charge, Professor Alok Kumar Das sir, uh, for his support and cooperation. I express the utmost thankfulness to our respected uh, head of department, Dr. Ashish Kumar Maji sir, uh, for his involvement and encouragement. Uh, I express my uh, th great thankfulness to our uh, honourable resource uh, persons, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bhutto Das, Dr. Ranjan Sharkar, and uh, Mr. Shivam Sharkar for taking out time from their busy schedule to uh, grace the event with uh, such valuable information. Uh, I extend my warm gratitude to our beloved Devika Ma'am and Indari Ma'am, uh, professors of our department, uh, for organizing such an impactful uh, workshop. Uh, I must th thank to all the participants, teachers, and students of from our department and the non-teaching uh, members of our college uh, for their enthusiastic uh, attendance. And lastly, my heartfelt thanks to my batchmates, juniors, and all the dedicated person uh, from the different organization and institution within and outside India uh, for their active uh, participation. Uh, thank you, everyone, once again for making it a great success. Uh, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you.